Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. People are joining. Hello, hi. My name is Nikesh. Nikesh Shukla. Um, I am here to talk to you um, about a book called The Good Immigrant that is out in paperback in the UK now. And uh, Waterstones have very kindly let me take over the Instagram here in a second. I'm really excited to talk to her. I'm going to be with you for the next 32 minutes because I don't know about you, but I really don't like long Instagram lives. Hey, Mona. Hi, Nikesh. How are you? I am fine. How are you? You know, none of us are really fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, pretend? Um, because we should um, be like, yay, pr- promotional things. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's amazing. Um, I was just trying to see if I, if I only have the hardback, but it's on a shelf too far away from me. But yeah, it's an exciting day. Yeah, so basically... Uh, for those of you who are joining us, um, I edited, four years ago, I edited a book called The Good Immigrant, uh, which was 21 British writers of colour writing about race and immigration in the UK. And we decided to um, go to America and do an American edition. And uh, so we did a book called The Good Immigrant USA, which has just come out in paperback with four covers. Thank you to the lovely dialogue books for blessing us with not one, not two, not three the four covers for the Good Immigrant uh, USA, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, there are 26 contributors uh, from Fatima Asgur to Jay Chang to Teju Cole and Yan Demange and Kutika Malika Rajuna, Priya Minas, uh, Teju Rao, so many, so many contributors. And uh, you are one of the contributors. And I just, um, I'm going to introduce you properly because this is the weird thing about, I find with Instagram lives, you go live, and it's like you're just doing FaceTime with your mate. Yeah. You forget that people are watching it. So I, I should do like the, I'm not catching up with my friend Mona. I'm actually in conversation with a journalist and writer. You're doing both. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So Mona is a journalist who lives in New York and she's written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, New York Review of Books, The Guardian, uh, so many different places. And uh, she's an amazing illustrator and writer and journalist and also a contributor to The Good Imprint at the USA. Uh, welcome, Mona, to our Thanks, interview. Thanks for having me. So um, we've, I guess we've gone... How, how many times in the last eight months have you started an email with... I hope you are well in these strange times. It's just, there's no good openers and there's no good closers either. Like, I also find that, the, like, take care doesn't quite cut it. Like, um, I don't know, like, I hope you're well. I don't know, even things that were just, like, so easy and given or inadequate as words now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm finding that communications are quite intense. And so... Mm-hmm. And the other thing I was saying this to you on text a couple of weeks ago, like what I really miss is just chatting rubbish with friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, instead of going, hey, if you need to talk to people, I'm like, if you want to talk about season one of Dave, I'm your yes. guy. I'm, like, I'm not your guy for like existential crisis. I'm your guy for let's just talk about television until yeah. uh, until things get too real. <laughs> um, so... Yes, let's let's start off by talking about the Good Immigrant USA because it's obviously it's out in paperback and mm-hmm. this is the Waterstones account so obviously people can go to their nearest Waterstones and uh, pick up a copy, pick up four copies, pick up four copies with different covers. I just so um, how did you come to the project? I think we have a mutual friend in Emmy the Great and yeah. in May uh, May Higgins actually contributed to this book yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I was obviously aware of your work before before then. Can you just tell me a little bit? You're, you're described as a data journalist, and mm. I just want want to just to tell people who are watching what that actually means. Um, so it's just like normal journalists, I suppose, except that um, data statistics kind of a story that I write. Very glad to wine. It's exactly what we like to see. Um, uh, <laughs> And I just, I really, really enjoy what I do because it basically means that I can look at any subject which is of interest to me. And I'm like a lot of journalists, I think I um, can be sort of interested in a bunch of different topics. 
I enjoy kind of flitting between different subjects. Um, but the only difference is that I use data as well. So, you know, um, I'm trying to think about some of the things that I'm writing about at the moment. I'm writing about Supreme Court justices. I'm writing about the election, obviously. Um, I have been writing a lot about uh, social justice issues, uh, equality in, in the US, the quite catastrophic failings of the criminal justice system. Also, like, you know, like the subjects as well, like bodily functions. Um, and, and later, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Because I can hear some kind of weird rustling and I don't know if it's me. Is it me? Um, you we're crackling a little bit but yeah i think you're um i wonder what it is i think with this conversation is just too hot for the internet right now <laughs> i'm gonna try uh, what, to stop on something and see if that makes a difference what i what i really love about your instagram account if people aren't already following you on instagram is um you give us a real insight into the creative process and so going back to that thing that you were saying today about supreme court justice so if you go to your instagram stories now mm -hmm. we see like how it's all coming together which i really i really love watching the process so like i've seen screen grabs of like some excel spreadsheets and I've seen some screen grabs of some like little figures that you bought from like a cheap and nasty store or something. And I the next they were from next a cheap time... and nasty store. They're from um, an art supply store, and the only thing that they had were architectural figures. Those things cost like ten dollars, even though they're this big. Yeah. Anyway. So can you can you tell us a bit about like I, I guess maybe that. Um, I mean, should we let let's talk about it in relation to your essay in the book because. Yeah your essay in the book isn't an essay it's a you know it's it's a wonderful infographic it's it, it's also something that you it's, it's also kinesthetic so you can like play with it um it's it's an excuse to rip up a book which i really love um can you just so do you want to just tell it tell us a little yeah. bit about what it was and how that how you kind of came to that and obviously feel free to just stop talking you can't hear me for some reason it really is quite strange but yeah, as long as you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the comments back on and just see if people have said anything about. Okay. Oh yeah, people have said that video is bad. They can't really understand um... me. I wonder what it is because the video is super clear. Is it? Could it be? Do you have headphones? In here? So it could also be the feedback of like you. you, you I don't know. Um, I've just turned you down. Maybe um, maybe that maybe. works. Oh, that already sounds a little bit better from my end. Okay. I will okay. put some headphones in. Mona's can, voice you... is breaking up. Oh, no. Uh, I can also try... Oh. Um, try to... I'm sorry. Yeah, do you want to try going out and coming back in? Yeah, do you want to try going out and coming back in again? Well, and, um... how... yeah, I is think this any I better? Think that's fine. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, better. Great, great. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I actually switched. Okay, thank you everyone for commenting. It's better. That's um, low, really, really helpful. Um, the video image is clear, but the audio was crackly. Headphones should sort it anyway. Hopefully, we're fine. Hopefully, we're fine. Um, so yes, Nikki, she kind of asked me two questions. One is like how I break down what the process of my work, and the second one is about the contribution to the book itself. And I kind of see those two questions as related. So um, uh, the thing that to me that's really exciting about data journalism is I think with normal journalism or like non it can be hard sometimes to talk a reader through exactly how you found your sources, exactly which quotes you chose, why you chose that quotes, you know, it can be hard to kind of build in that transparency. And I think that transparency is really important to build trust between readers and journalists. Now, with data journalism, I feel like there's just like a methodology that's naturally baked in. Um, so I think this has made it worse. I've just heard like a weird echo. No. no. I, think we're, I think we're just going to have to power okay. through. We'll power on. Okay, sorry. Otherwise, um, we'll get really paranoid the yeah. whole time. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I feel like it's quite natural to say to people, first of all, I went to this source. Second of all, I, I checked where these numbers had came from. Third of all, I saw whether this trend has increased over time or I saw which racial groups were most affected by this thing. The questions that I'm asking as a journalist, I feel like I can also like really show my workings, you know, like in a really visible way to people. Um, 
so the in in a way the, it's kind of like the essay in the book and essay is a bit i think of a generous term it's like a very very short little contribution i, I think i'm the smallest contribution in the book so i'm very flattered to be um asked to speak with you today um is just walking readers through a number of steps of how I understood something. So the thing that I want to understand, I guess, is just some data on migration. And the idea is that you rip out a page in the book, as you said, kind of sacrilegious, but maybe sort of fun. Um, and then you walk through these steps of, you know, this one sheet represents every migrant in the world. Now fold it in half. I I'm, think I'm gonna remember some of the steps. If you fold it in half, that represents the 50% of migrants that end up in rich countries, right? Yeah. And then I think the next... 51%. 51% thing. <laughs> yeah, it was really tricky to make the folds work with the percentages. But anyway, and then I think the next fact is about remittances, which is obviously really, really critical when we're talking about immigration. Um, and basically, you keep on folding. Each fold represents a statistic, and then you end up with a paper aeroplane. It doesn't look like a paper aeroplane, but it doesn't it? It'll be a paper aeroplane. Yeah, it's... Um, oh, my it's... God, my cousin's watching. Go away. <laughs> Um, also, our editor, Charmaine Lovegrove, is in the comments, so it's really oh, nice to see Charmaine. Um, yeah, yeah, what I love about it is, I think, I think in, an, in amongst all of these essays um, that, you know, are by turns very emotional, very angry, very, mm -hmm. very sad, very funny, in some places, um, very nostalgic, what, you come, what, you, uh, what you've done is just gone, look this is the reality and you've presented it in really pragmatic terms. And, and I, and I, I really appreciate that, that tonal shift in the book. Cause I, you know, the last thing you want in a letter collection is for everything to kind of feel like it's the same, you know, you mm. don't want to just read 26 of the same essays. Um, and so <clears throat> out of interest, what, you know, cause mm. we gave you a very open brief. Why did you think this is what I want to do? And why did you not go, I'm going to write about my childhood in North London <laughs> Um, East London. First. East London. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. I apologize. Um, and secondly, I think for me, because so much of my writing is online, whenever I do get commissions like this, I'm excited at the idea of having a physical product. Like, how can you do something that's different with the fact of having like an actual book in your hands? You know, like I kind of, I think that's exciting. You know, yeah. Mm. Obviously, yeah. it means it's quite shitty for your Kindle readers. There's nothing really they can do with it, but still. I mean, they could rip their Kindle up and uh, buy a physical book. <laughs> Although, I, I, ha I will say that I've quite enjoyed reading stuff on a Kindle in lockdown. It's kind of, it's meant that stuff's reached me quicker. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, I think, anyway, I don't need to, tell you, I need to talk for 10 minutes about how I've started re <laughs> reading stuff on a Kindle. Um <laughs> So, wh what when you were when you were putting it, putting your the essay together, what what was the thing that sort of most surprised you about uh, from your research? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that comes up again and again in my work is the capitalist, the capitalist exploitation of the masses, um, <laughs> particularly of vulnerable communities, right? So something that I'm trying to find ways to visualize at the moment is the way that um, prisoners in the US criminal justice system are really exploited for their money. So the cost of making a phone call in prison is vastly, vastly more expensive because certain networks operate those phone lines. Again, it mm. sounds really but I think it's really indicative of so many different layers of like injustice. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about so much with regard to immigration is how much money Western Union makes and all of these transfer companies from people's desperately, desperately hard-earned money. Like, the idea of taking, you know, 15, 20% off of someone's, you know, $100 check home, to me is just, I don't know, it's just disgusting. So it's kind of like, sometimes I just have one thing that I think is really, really fucked up, and then it's like, how do you reverse into it with valuable information? people to give them that bigger context so again I, I know i'm being really verbose here i'm going to shut up in a second but i think really good data journalism is that act of zooming out so it's like one person tells you their story and that story by the way should count it's not like oh it's just an anecdote it doesn't matter 
I care about individual stories, but how can you amplify those voices and those individual experiences by taking a step back and understanding the broad patterns about how frequently migrants are exploited for their money, how frequently they're underpaid and then overtaxed for what they earn, you know? Yeah, and by overtaxed, I just mean, yeah, paying too much to companies like Western Union. Yeah, and that's super interesting because like the capitalism involved in border controls is just mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. mind blowing. Like, I guess like even in the UK, what what we're seeing at the moment with like this thing that's happening in Kent, where there's going to be some sort of border mm. to kind of try and um, try and reconcile the reality of Brexit with the the concept of a Brexit. And and you realise like how deep this goes, you know. Even, I guess even with like even with COVID, uh, like not to get sort of on my political <laughs> political box on on uh, the Waterstones Instagram account, but like just thinking about the different contracts that are kind of going to um, these sort of chums of politicians to kind of tell us what we already know about how things like COVID. Um, you can trace it along socioeconomic lines, you know, in the in the UK, and I, I I just think that there is so much money in all of that, and none of it's going to those communities. Mm-hmm. It it blows my mind. Um, where, you you talk you talk there about um, how things take your interest. It, do do you have do you do you have a, like a particular a particular thing that always makes you go sit up and go this is something I'm interested in or, or mm-hmm. do you, do, are you one of those people who reads quite widely? Like basically, I, like, I, I'm trying to ask this question without asking it in a, the facile, where'd you get your ideas from Mona? But I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm interested in like how you begin your day, whether you're the type of person who reads like pretty much mm-hmm. everything or whether you, you start from a position of interest and then try and find stuff around it. It honestly depends. Like some of the ideas literally will come up like over dinner a friend will tell me, you know, like um, a friend of mine is a high school teacher here and she was just like, I'm really curious, like what drugs the kids in my class are most likely to be taking. Like I've been, it's been a while since I was like 14 years old. I'm like, what drugs are the kids taking now? Um, and so I'll like look into research on the most popular drugs among 14 year olds currently. Um, and some of it is, as you say, like waking up, seeing, seeing what's happening in the world and trying to figure out what questions people might have. But my, I don't, I I do actually read, I would say most of my DMs. I don't get a chance to respond to everyone, but I really listen to the questions that other people ask me because obviously, you know, I think some data journalists try to present their work as like this end finite goal in journalism of perfect objectivity. And I don't believe that for a second. I think the questions that I come up with are the questions that are of interest to me as, you know, who I am as a British woman, as an Arab, as an immigrant to America. And like, I'm curious about other people's questions as well. So those, those messages I get from people that ask very specific questions are really important. Yeah. So how, how long have you lived in America now? Seven years. Uh, seven years. Um, and what, what would you, you know, you know, having, having that kind of, slightly removed perspective of the uk Mm. like how how does it look from sort of just watching it from afar obviously like you know with with family and friends still here you know we've we've seen we've seen some really really big things happen in the last couple of years Mm -hmm. like what is your perspective from over 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 the pond quite deep and overwhelming sadness um you know, I think like a lot of second generation immigrants, the concept of home was always a little bit complicated growing up because I was constantly reminded by white people, various white people, that Britain wasn't my home, or I was being told that frequently. Um, and then having spent seven years here, I don't know, like the concept of going back or going back home to Britain feels more and more... Um, I don't know, almost as if it's under threat somehow. I can't really explain it. The one thing I will say from having spent these seven years here is it does feel like when I was growing up, again, this is like, I'm not speaking for like, I'm not as a political journalist here. This is very much based on my own experiences. It felt like there was like an absolute adamant that like racism isn't really a thing in Britain, really. There's like the right fringe 
like, you know, English Defence League or whatever. But like most of us are good and we're fine. I feel like in America, like there isn't that same degree of delusion because for obvious, for very obvious historical reasons. But I, I think that one of the more positive changes that I've seen is like, I feel like some of that um, willful ignorance, it's not even ignorance actually, some of that, those willful lies of like, everything's fine here, there's nothing to be here, are finally unraveling. I mean, what, what do you think about how Britain's changed over the past seven Yeah, I don't know if it has changed. I, 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 mm. think, I think if anything, I don't think, you know, Brexit happened and we birthed a whole generation of um, racists, immigrant haters. Mm -hmm. I just think people kind of stepped out from un from the shadows and like, it's interesting. It's interesting seeing the parts that different institutions have have kind of played in it, whether willingly or unwillingly mm -hmm. or accidentally, whether it's the media or the education system. But I sort of feel like all of these systems have been gained by some very, very clever people who kind of get us get us worry you know they they get us worrying about the sort of oh have you frozen oh no you haven't um get us worrying about like the big questions of like you know the big existential questions of what is it is to be british mm -hmm. and like the culture wars that that inspires mm -hmm. while meanwhile they're all kind of just getting on with screwing mm -hmm. the country um and, I and a really specific example of something that happened where i was like oh things are really really different in the uk to how they are in the us which i knew in anyway but it was such a bizarre flashpoint so um after the i mean i hope that the black lives matters protests are still very much ongoing in the uk they are definitely over here in, in new york on a daily basis um but I would say when they were more at their peak, I remember there was a, a new statue that was built of a Black Lives Matter protester. Um, do you remember this? She, she, it was like a huge um, unveiled statue. I think it was for Bristol and it was possibly to replace the statue that was taken of the of the man who traded enslaved people. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm like I'm like 25 minutes walk from where that where that oh, happened. Oh, OK. Um, so the, the new statue was unveiled and it was like, being written about everywhere including in the guardian of like look how beautiful this work is well and it was done by a white guy and like over here no way would would that have been lauded in quite the same way if an opportunity as critical as that to contribute to like this key political moment in british history was art about black lives had been given to a white person and it just felt like like there was criticism of it afterwards i don't want to suggest for a second that it wasn't criticized but that criticism felt like it took a while to get into the mainstream um and that was pretty shocking yeah 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 it was interesting watching it play out internationally because obviously i live in bristol and it's all yeah. very local to me but like i because i saw a completely different perspective and to see what it meant for the for young black kids in the city mm -hmm. that was a really interesting it was very interesting how different that was from like how it was being written about Internationally. Think, like it could still mean so much to young black kids in the city if they not only saw themselves represented in art but if they saw themselves also being given the opportunity to create that art like yeah definitely even more you know like i don't know it's yeah, maybe no, not for me to say but i found it quite shocking yeah yeah i think how it was done was probably the the kind of the thing that caused the most irritation mm. in, in the city because this it, this is a very creative uh, city filled with artists filled with amazing mm -hmm. black artists and and i think they you know now i'm really glad that like the conversations are like finally involving those artists um the last question i wanted to ask before we get to there's a bunch of questions that people have asked um oh. where where you know obviously we, we you know this book has come out uh we're two weeks bef oh. uh till the election I know it's probably like the one thing that you're like, I do not want to talk about that, but it's kind of unavoidable. You know, there's, there's COVID and there's the American presidential mm. election. I just wonder how you're feeling about it all. Really, really, really anxious. Um, I think so. As a data journalist, I'm deeply skeptical of polls. I don't really believe in election forecasting. That's based on um, my experiences, both working for um, Nate Silver's website over at, in 5 at 5.38. That's the reason why I moved to the US. He became very successful in doing uh, election polling forecasts. Obviously, he got it massively wrong in 2016. Um, and basically, 
Um, I'm very, very sceptical of polls. I'm very sceptical of polls now. Things can change very, very rapidly. What are we, 16 days out, I think? Mm. Um, a lot can still change. Um, I also think it's not clear what the effects of the pandemic are going to be on voting behaviour and just the extent to which... Um, I mean, I don't know if this is the kind of answer you're looking for. I'm just really, really anxious. And I also think that even um, Biden wins... I think that uh, many Trump supporters are going to be galvanised by his presidency and it's not going to be, it's not going to be simple, you know, like the next few years are still going to be incredibly complicated. So, um, yeah, that's quite an indirect answer, basically, it's just saying I'm losing sleep on a regular basis. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you answered it with your truth rather than... <laughs> Um, with anything else um, so I, I need to load up my emails because a, mm -hmm. a couple of questions were asked um, but uh, 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 but also Akash Akash asks how do you stay positive in mostly negative news uh, cycles these days I mean if anyone can give me the answer to this I will pay you <laughs> handsomely because <laughs> I don't know it's a really good question and I would say honestly the thing that's great about good data journalism is data journalism, sorry, my neighbor's listening to some music quite loudly. Um, good data journalism has nuance in it, right? Because there's all these different cross tabs you can find like, you know, so let's say for example, um, I don't know, let's say hate crimes against Muslims have risen in 40 states. If I want to stay optimistic, I'm going to look at the 10 states where hate crimes against Muslims fell. And I'm going to try to understand what happened there that meant that people like, you know, that hate crimes improved. I mean, hate crimes are actually a terrible example because the uh, statistical reporting about them is so wildly inaccurate. But um, do you see what I mean? Like, you can always find one story, whether it's one demographic group, one geographic area, one historical time period, where the story is a more positive one. And it's just about, I know this is such a cheesy expression, but sometimes, like, kind of being a bit of a detective for the good. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I, on Nim's bookshelf asks, who inspires you? E, Emmy does. Emmy, our mutual friend. I literally, um, I, we, I watched her perform at the Barbican the other night. And oh, yeah, it was so I, good. I just cried like a baby, literally from like the third note that she sang. I was just so moved. And it's like we were all on a group text thread talking about her. And she was just like singing while playing three instruments at the same time. Yeah, it was, it was mad. It was she so wrote good. it all herself. Like, she, yeah, she definitely inspires me, yeah. And uh, so someone else asked, how did you choose which writers to people, or oh, people you'd included in the book? Yeah, it's funny because, mm -hmm. I, I guess that's a question for me. Um, yeah, with the first book, I just asked a lot of people and the people who ended up in the UK book were just the people who said yes. Mm -hmm. And then or, re replied, to, replied to my email and said yes and turned in a draft and then did their edits on time. With the second book, we kind of wanted to um, be a bit more targeted. So we, uh, we we were definitely looking for people who had different and interesting things to say, different and interesting backgrounds. Um, but again, it was a lot of um, just just thinking who who do we think it, who do we think is interesting? And you know, like as with most most anthologies, like the difference between who we asked, um, who we who we asked, and who we um, who ended up in the book was were two two very very different things. So like there wasn't an exact science to it. Yes, there is something on my head. It's uh, a, a spot that I've been stress scratching. I just saw six. that comment. It's so <laughs> fucking rude. Yeah, thanks, thanks for. Um, I I guess you got the attention you were looking for all this maybe, time. Maybe maybe it was intended to be really considerate and sweet, but yeah. <laughs> um, someone keeps asking, when is your book coming out? If it's coming out, um, are you working on a book, Mona? Are you sure that question's not for you? I think that question's for you, Nick Fish. I mean, I've got a book coming out. I no, let's talk about your book. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've got a book coming out in February next year called Brown Baby, um, which is a memoir about parenthood and grief. Uh, but it's but it's funny. <laughs> but it's funny and hopeful. Emily, speaking of Emmy again, our faithful friend, she told me it's one of the best things she's ever read, and that was completely behind your back, just totally sincerely. She said it's incredible. Jesus. 
Um, yeah, it's very nervous. I'm very nervous about it, but <coughs> yeah, but um, very well avoided uh, answer there, Mona. I, I, I commend your, <laughs> I commend your dodge, and I will, I will acknowledge it, and I will also move on. Uh, someone wants to know what you would, what you would suggest for someone who wants to walk the path of data journalism. Um, honestly, I get asked this a lot, and there aren't really specific go-to courses that I would suggest. I would just say, suggest, honestly, having just infinite patience. Like, you hit so many dead ends, whether it's that the data simply doesn't exist, or that the data hasn't been updated for 10 years, that the data only exists for one local authority, and you just have to, like, just... It's quite, I feel like this is quite a gross analogy, but sometimes I feel like I'm just like a little rat that's scurrying along. I hit a dead end and then I just kind of scurry off in a different direction. And all of the scurrying ends up being part of the narrative. Like where the data doesn't exist, I know I'm going off on a different tangent here, but where the data doesn't exist also tells you about where power lies and where, what, what numbers people deem worthy of collecting and which information is, is considered valuable. Yeah, so basically I don't have any specific courses, just stick at it, um, watch a bunch of YouTube tutorials uh, and yeah. Bef before we wrap up, Mona, do you want to no. just quickly talk about the project that is behind you? and uh, oh, yeah. how, how that has turned into a wonderful thing that people who, who might be in New York can go, kind of go and interact with. Yeah, so um, it is called 100 New Yorkers and was um, an attempt to draw 100 characters. Um, and, oh, the sound's doing something weird again. Um, uh, anyway, sorry. Um, and so I took, looked up loads of demographic data about New York through the lens of gender, race, ethnicity, disability status, immigration status, income, and I turned all of that into 100 characters. Um, so the illustrations first appeared in the New York Times um, to illustrate how COVID affects different communities in different ways. Um, and then this large scale planting has also, sorry, my hand is on this. Um, has also been transformed into some um, graphics for the, that are currently up in the World Trade Center at the moment. But in Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. So Thank we're going to... So we're going to uh, go because I personally just really hate long Instagram lives. I just don't have the patience for them. Um, that's, why I don't, that's why I try and keep my own one short. Um, so before we go, uh, thank you so much to Woodstones for, um, for hosting our Instagram account. Thank you to Dialogue Books uh, for putting out The Good Immigrant USA. Uh, thank you to Emmy the Great for bringing us and Maeve Higgins for bringing us together. Um, go to Mona Chalabi's Instagram page and follow her and go to her shop. She's got loads of prints for sale that are amazing um and the paperback of the good immigrant usa is out now and also if you miss book readings i am hosting a new um book reading series um where i've got a bunch of writers reading from their work next week uh next thursday you can if you go to my instagram which is nikesh shukla writer you can find out more about that and come and hang out with us and hear readings from books, which is something that in the pandemic I have really missed. But thank you so much, thank Mona. You. I'll let you get to your your call now. It was great to see you and we will catch up soon. Likewise. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. Bye.